Welcome back everyone. In this video, we'll be talking about a couple of redactions made to the Quran. And as we do so, we'll be posing some questions for Muslims and their popular claims about the Quran's preservation, whether written or oral. Let's begin with a review of the compilation of the Quran as it began with Abu Bakr. He said to Zayd, search for fragmentary scripts of the Quran and collect it in one book. This was very difficult for Zayd compared to shifting a mountain. Zayd said, so I started compiling the Quran by collecting it from leafless stalks of date palm trees, pieces of leather, hides, stones, and so forth, and also from the memories of men. From the beginning, then, we see that the Quran was not primarily preserved in memory. Notice the diversity of sources that Zayd used. Leafless stalks of the date palm tree, pieces of leather and hides, and from stones, and from memories. Surely the Caliph had the authority to simply call everyone who had memorized the complete Quran together. Just sit them down at a table, and as they recite, have Zayd record their words. But this isn't what happened. The Quran was in fragmentary form, explaining in part the difficulty of Zayd's task. Nevertheless, he finished his work, and the manuscripts of the Quran remained with Abu Bakr, and then Umar, and then Hafsa. Now let's fast forward to Uthman. Problems arose because of differences in the recitation of the Quran, so Uthman sent a message to Hafsa, asking for the manuscripts that he would compile in perfect copies and then return them. He called on Zayd once again. In the case of any disagreements, it was to be written in the dialect of the Quraysh. When this was complete, Uthman sent his copies out to various provinces and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. Now you would think Zayd would say something like, I've already done this, why am I doing it again? But he doesn't seem to object. But notice the concern. It's with differences in the recitation of the Quran. So what is Uthman's solution to compile the Quranic materials in perfect copies and then burn his source material? So the variations in these manuscripts are causing problems for the early Muslims. But this raises an interesting question. What did Uthman do with his source material? He burned it. But if the Quran was preserved in memory, as many Muslims claim today, why didn't Uthman account for this fact? If the memorization of the Quran was so dominant, destroying manuscripts would not accomplish Uthman's goal of eliminating variant readings. Now, what kind of changes did Uthman make during his recension? Well, of course, it's difficult to tell when you burn your source material, but we do have some reports about some problems with Uthman's recension. Numerous tafsir and other sources describe the 200 verses that were once in Surah 33. But when Uthman wrote out the codices, he was unable to procure more of it than there is today. And interestingly, according to Ubay ibn Qab, during the lifetime of Muhammad, Surah 33 had 286 verses. Notice these were recited in the lifetime of Muhammad and then lost after. So Uthman apparently lost several dozen verses out of just one surah, but he also made some unspecified changes. Abu Muhammad said whilst copying the Musafs, he burnt what he burnt from them from what he had changed intentionally or by mistake. Aisha's copy contained a variant reading of Surah 3356, but this was before Uthman altered the scripture. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of these reports, so let's just leave them for now and move further down our timeline. Did Uthman eliminate all of the variant readings? No, he did not. In the early 8th century, Al-Hajjaj, who is the governor of the Caliph Abdul-Malik, is talking about a reading attributed to Abdullah bin Masud, and he doesn't like it. He doesn't like it at all. I mean, he really doesn't like it. Al-Hajjaj swore that he would erase Ibn Masud's reading from the Mus'haf, even if it would be with a rib of a swine. On these early manuscripts, if you want to erase the ink off the parchment, you have to scrape it off with a stone or something of that sort. In this case, al Jaj says he would scrape Abdullah ibn Masud's reading off the manuscript with the bone of a pig. This is the guy revising your Quran, Muslims. And of course, it doesn't stop there. He also said he would kill anyone who is using Abdullah ibn Masud's reading. But this is ironic because Muhammad apparently said, learn the recitation of the Quran from these four persons, and Abdullah ibn Masud is one of them. So at the time of Al-Hajjaj, apparently this narration didn't exist, or he didn't know about it, or he didn't care because he demonstrably violated what Muhammad says in this hadith. Now, what kind of changes did Al-Hajjaj make? Once again, it's difficult to tell, but we can try to paint a rough picture. The sources report that the caliph, Abdul Malik, instructed his advisor, Al-Hajjaj, to revise the text of the Quran by changing the consonantal skeleton of certain words. 
He also introduced vowels and diacritical marks for the first time. Sounding much like Uthman, the sources also report that any codex whose consonantal skeleton was not identical to that of the Umayyad codex was recalled and destroyed. This would explain why little or no manuscript evidence has survived that would make it possible to verify the nature of any change or changes introduced at that time. Also, we have Al-Kindi and Abraham of Tiberias. They say that Hajjaj gathered together every last copy and caused to be omitted from the text many things. Kindi averse to his Muslim addressee that all that I have said is drawn from your own sources, and this would appear to be so, for we find notices in Arabic sources that Hajjaj ibn Yusuf wrote exemplars of the Quran and sent them to the chief cities that he changed the wording or eliminated variant readings or introduced diacritical marks into the text. So just like Uthman, Al-Hajjaj destroyed the competing copies and then put his manuscripts into circulation. But his destruction was more widespread than Uthman's. Al-Hajjaj destroyed both public and private manuscripts. As you can imagine, some were not happy, including Uthman's family. We have a report of the angry reaction of the family of Uthman towards the new Medinan Quran recension. The governor of Egypt even flatly refused al ajajs new Quran, but in spite of these difficulties, he was largely successful in standardizing his new text, and by the 2nd century AH, Uthman's manuscript had become a thing of the past. The Uthmanic Codex had disappeared. We have a couple of questions that are relevant to the preservation of the Quran. Whose Quran or recension was memorized or preserved? Was it Muhammad, Uthman, or al ajaj Further, who gave Uthman or al ajaj the authority to redact the Quran? These are important questions that Muslims who want to claim the Quran has been preserved need to answer. Let's put this another way. On your screen, you have a timeline with dates for the various Qurans and or recensions. Now, our timeline begins with Muhammad's death at 632, but there's very good reason for thinking that Muhammad was alive several years later. We have about 11 sources in the 7th and 8th century that indicate this. But we'll start with 632, so let's just go with that. Now let's ask some questions. Which Quran has been preserved along this timeline? If it's the one from Muhammad in 632, then why was Zayd's collection needed? And why was it so difficult to collect the Quran? Why did he need to collect it from so many different fragmented sources? How do we know Abu Bakr's Quran was reliable at all? Moving on to Uthman around 650, why was Uthman's standardization needed? Why repeat Abu Bakr's work done just over 15 years earlier? If the Quran was memorized as Muslims claim, then why the differences? And why did Uthman destroy manuscripts? If the Quran was memorized, this would have done no good. Who gave Uthman the authority to do this? What changes did Uthman make? Similar questions can be asked of Al-Hajjaj in the early 8th century. Who gave him authority? What was his motivation? What did he change? Why did he destroy the other Qurans? Why is it that at no point during these recensions do Uthman or Al-Hajjaj indicate that oral preservation of the Quran will persist through their textual revisions? How can any Muslim possibly argue that the Quran was fixed in oral or written form before Al-Hajjaj? The data say it was not. The concept of a fixed Quran in either Muhammad's time or Uthman's time is complete fiction. Now, there's more. Muslim scribes, just like other scribes, would count the words in their manuscripts as a way to detect errors in their copying. So let's look at some of these differences. With the verses, we do have a couple of abbreviations here. These just refer to the modern version, with or without the Bismillah, depending on how many chapters you put that with. We also have variations in the number of words, from about 77,200 up to 77,900. And consonants vary from about 300,000 to 363,000. Don't you wish we had word counts for all of those manuscripts that were destroyed? So Muslims, regarding the preservation of the Quran, which of these, if any, correspond to the memorized or the written Quran? One of them? All of them? What criteria do you use to choose between them? Which of these is the superior reading? We've been told there's only one Quran. Why all of these variants? Why all of these revisions? And why do we have so many variations, given that so many manuscripts were destroyed? Based on the evidence presented in this video, I draw numerous conclusions. I'll share three of them with you. Any theory of miraculous or perfect preservation of the Quran is complete nonsense. Two, given the destruction of Uthman and al ajaj it is impossible to know the original Quranic readings. And three, the Quran could not have reached a stable form before the early 8th century AD. Muslims, if you want to object to this video, begin your comment by saying, 
I watched the entire video. And if you don't do that, I'll know that you didn't watch the video. And in typical Muslim fashion, you're trying to comment anyway. So let's see how many Muslims don't do this and how many Muslims we can amaze with our psychic knowledge that they're trying to comment without watching the video. For the rest of you, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.